Hey, what's up everybody? Chad Kalik here, and welcome back to the Intercredit Room Podcast, where I have two announcements for you. The first announcement is that our special Halloween season limited time offers are back at www.aghtelevision.com, which if you click the link in the description box below, you will see that one of those offers that you can get right now is to watch my entire 18 film documentary catalog on Vimeo On Demand for only $50. That is just a little over $3 per film. I'm excited about it because I get asked all the time, where can I see your films? Well, this is one very easy way to see all of them. And each film also has a 30-day rental. Each film can also be streamed on your television, your laptop, your tablet, your smartphone, desktop, you name it. And it also is available in 150 countries, so you can't beat that. And my second announcement is that before the pandemic hit, on the side, I started doing these special podcast series, which were essentially these deep dives into all the films that I've made. And they were very successful. We were having a blast with it. The first one was about American Ghost Hunter. It was called The Devil in the Details. And I also did a special podcast series about the making of A Blood Red Sky at Chillingham Castle, which was one of the wildest experiences of my life. And everything that went into that, you know, bringing that film to life and also just living in Chillingham Castle and the amount of activity and strangeness, it was just off the hook. And I thought now that uh, life is getting back to normal, I thought that I would release the Blood Red Sky Notes from the Most Haunted Structure in the World special podcast series. So that's what this is. This is episode number one, and every night I will release a new episode in addition to the In a Crowded Room podcast. Also, I have a bunch more of these that are going to be starting up in January, in which in November and December, I'm going to be actually recording them now that 74 minutes will be out of the way. So for those that have been waiting, thank you for your patience. This pandemic has just been a bitch on work. It's been just a... Really hard time, especially when you're talking about doing things creatively. It's just so hard to jump into seven different creative projects to try to make them work. Um, But I am very excited to get back uh, to doing these. And again, these are typically separate from the actual podcast because they help support the podcast. But I want you to know what these things are like. So I figured it's Halloween season. What a great time to roll out the Blood Red Sky special podcast series called Notes. From the most haunted structure in the world. Enjoy part one. The story of a blood red sky dates all the way back to when I was 18 years old. I think I've told this story on one of my podcasts before, but this all stems from my father was injured when I was in high school. Um, If you're listening to the AGH podcast, you know that he's been burnt severely and he had made a recovery. Uh, But it was difficult for him to go out to public places, um, especially if it's a hot day. You know, plus he has scar tissue, and he was just never that comfortable being around public crowds. So he never uh, came to any of my high school baseball games. And it's not that he didn't, you know, uh, you know, didn't love me or didn't want to be there. He was extremely supportive, and he was a great father. And um, I just knew it was uncomfortable for him, and it wasn't something that I wanted to push him to do. Uh, But he did come to my last final high school baseball game, my last home game, actually. And he had not seen me play a game since I was young, nine years old, before he got injured. And I was a, a good baseball player, you know. That was one thing that God, you know, gave me the talent to do. And I very rarely struck out. I think the whole season I might have struck out once or twice uh, in 40 games. And uh, this is the last game. And the first three times that I come up to the plate, you know, my dad's there watching me. And I'll be honest, it's making me nervous. I really want to do well in front of him. And I struck out three times in a row. (laughs) And I I knew it was those nerves. I could feel it. it. It was... I was thinking too much, Uh, you know, the key of being a good hitter is to just react. Just don't think, react. Just clear your mind and react. 
and I had so much on my mind. And my last at bat, before I stepped into the plate, and I knew it, I knew this would be the last time he would ever see me swing a baseball bat. And something happened. I've talked about this a lot, you know, uh, at public speaking events as well, but something happened. Something took over, and I crushed a 400-foot home run. I mean, it was the biggest home run I've ever hit. It couldn't have been more perfect. It was a high fastball, which I could, most of the time, that's the one pitch that I could never catch up with that that could strike me out, uh, just because it's closer to your face when it comes in. The the baseball is, is closer to eye level, so it's hard to lay off of. And it's hard to get the barrel of the bat, you know, uh, at shoulder level. So it's a pitch that historically strikes uh, most batters out. You know, they, whenever you have like an 0-2 count or a 3-2 count, pitchers always try to get you to chase a high fastball. Um, well, this was the first pitch he threw me was a high fastball. And I swung as hard as I could. And I couldn't have hit it any more perfect. But I... <laughs> There was something different that happened. Something happened. Something took over and just did it. It was almost like I woke up when I was rounding second base. It was almost like I wasn't present, like, uh, you know, like something subconsciously took over. And I spoke to Laura about it that night. You know, not in great detail, but I remember leaving the ballpark with her and going, man, you know, something took over, you know, like it was some, something happened. Because she was like so excited. She was like, you did it. You know, your dad got to see this. And wow, you know, like what a night. Your last at bat at home ever. You hit a three-run homer. You know, uh, our left field was <clears throat> just like Field of Dreams. It was uh, the fence would run right up to the, this cornfield. I mean, the ball landed probably, you know, 40 rows deep in the corn. I mean, it was, it was, it was, I've never since or before hit a ball that far. And, uh, that stuck with me my whole life. What happened? Something took over in my brain. Something that I would later learn to be what I believe to be psychokinetic, like the power of the mind. And it stayed with me for a long, 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 long time. And I didn't know back then that I would necessarily make a documentary about this or come up with a series of tests or anything or experiments. But I knew that one day I wanted to put that to the test. I wanted to find some way to put the power of the mind to the test. Okay. Now let's jump forward. All the way, 2005. I had just finished making Terra Normal. And I released it online, uh, the first part of it. And it did really well. I mean, it, it took off. I mean, it got 200,000, 300,000 views, like, quickly. And at that time, I did a very stupid thing as a young man working in Hollywood. I made that film on a handshake agreement of the things that I would provide and the things that I would do, the post and the editing and all this stuff, um, in exchange for a very small production fee, uh, in which my partner uh, didn't hold up his end. And uh, it was crushing to me, because this person was a a really good friend of mine. Now, thankfully, you know, years later, I got the chance to sit down with him 10 years later and kind of, you know, put it behind us. Um, but it was crushing to me at the time. And I had woke up one morning and I talked to Laura and I said, you know, I can't work on this Terranola project anymore. And it kills me because it, it's good. It's fun. You know, the timing is right. I enjoyed it. But this this agreement, this relationship, it's never going to work out. 
And I just said, you know, I'm just going to walk away now uh, because each day that I let it go on, it's just going to get worse and worse until, you know, pretty soon it's just a horrible situation that's uncurable. So I decided to do that. I was done. I had made the decision. I had gone down to the beach like I always do and did my, I guess it's the equivalent of prayer. It's just kind of, you know, talking to the world, talking to whoever, whoever God is, you know, and just kind of said, I don't know why you had me, you know, make this film or if I was meant to or not, but, you know, uh, just make sure that, you know, you take care of me moving forward here. You know, I've never been, you know, one to ask for specific things. Like, uh, when I have these little prayer sessions, I don't say like, you know, bring me a new Canon 5D or something like that. You know, it's more like I made this decision. This hurts. Uh, I lost a friend in this. I put a lot of work into something. I don't know why things have gone this direction. Uh, just make sure that I'm okay, you know, that I bounce back and do something greater, you know. And the following day, I'm in my car and I'm actually driving to meet a friend. He was working on another project because I needed to pick up some kind of work to make some kind of money. And I get a call from a friend of mine named Corey Moss, who's working at Yahoo, you know, the company Yahoo.com. And they have a new original content uh, development, you know, uh, department where they make an original series or they're talking about it. This is like in the early, early stages of original shows that would actually appear online. You know, now it's commonplace. It's everywhere. But uh, this was the early stages of that. And he says, where are you at right now? And I said, I'm on the 405, man. And he's like, okay, don't ask questions. Turn your car around right now. Here's an address. And you need to drive here right this second. And I'm like, what? And he's like, dude, so help me God, I just need you to do what I'm telling you to do. I'm like, okay. And I go, well, what's all this about? And he's like, do you have uh, that Terra Normal with you? Can you access it online? And I go, uh, yeah, actually, it's funny. I just took it down, uh, but I have the private files where you could watch them. He's like, but if you come down here, you know, we can pull them up. And I go, yeah, for sure. And he goes, okay, get down here right now. So I've known this uh, this friend, Corey, uh, since college. Um, I actually uh, worked with him back at our college newspaper. We were both ambitious, young uh, writers who were going to change the world with their pen. And uh, we just remained friends. And for some reason, his his path in life, um, you know, always followed mine, you know. So we were always wound up living blocks away from each other and everything. It was really neat. So um, <clears throat> he says, come on down. So I get down to, to Yahoo and I walk in and there's this tons of people, you know, that are in this line and... I'm like trying to figure out what's going on and I see Corey come out of this room and he was like, hey, you know, just come with me. And I'm like, okay, what is this about? And he goes, I, I can't tell you right now, but just, just come with me. And I'm like, okay. So I get in this room and I'm just waiting around with Corey and he goes, uh, you know, a friend of mine, or my boss, he said, uh, Drew, my boss Drew is going to be in here in a second. He's got some questions for you. And I'm like, okay. So, uh, it's probably about 15 minutes later, uh, this gentleman, Drew, comes in, and he questions me about the paranormal, nonstop. Uh, you know, he gets a million questions about it, <clears throat> and he questions me about filming the paranormal, and what you need, and what the, what the difficulties are, and what are my thoughts and beliefs, and, uh, you know, the categories, and the classifications, and where would I go if... You know, I had an infinite budget to do so, and, you know, this went on for probably, probably about 30, 40 minutes. And then he finally stops, and I noticed when I was in there that there was this tripod with something under it, and this, like, black curtain thing hanging over it. 
and he pulls this black curtain off and you see Steven Spielberg's The Rising and I'm like going whoa what is going on here and I learn that uh, Steven Spielberg wants to do something online uh, some kind of original series with the social media network with Yahoo as their partner and they're looking for a director <clears throat> They're looking for somebody to make this original series. And um, I'm like, wow. This could be huge. Holy cow. I mean, just yesterday, literally 24 hours earlier, I had quit Terra Normal. So, yeah. I signed this non-disclosure agreement that was like a book thick. That, uh you know, by now has certainly expired. Um, and I leave and I tell Corey, geez, man, I can't even thank you enough. That's, that's incredible, man. You know? <laughs> so I go home and I didn't even tell Laura about it the first night because I'm like, you know, what are the chances? You know, what are the chances? Slow down, Chad, slow down. You know, you have no idea if this is going to work. You have no idea if they even like to, you haven't even gotten a phone call about it yet. So why even bring it up to Laura? You know, why get her excited? Because, you know, in Hollywood, these opportunities come up all the time. But, you know, uh, this is an industry of continued pursuit, meaning uh, most of the time you, you don't get the gig. You know, you keep going until you find the one that works for you and you build upon those successes. So I didn't say anything the first night. <clears throat> and I didn't have to wait for long because the following morning I got a phone call from Corey going, man, you hit it out of the park. I just want you to know that, uh, you know, they want to send paranormal and your materials, photos of you, all this stuff. They want to send this over to Steven. So if you can give me the links to paranormal and any pictures of yourself, bio, stuff like that. And it's going to go to him today, like right now. And I'm like, wow, okay, awesome. So I give them everything they need. And uh, didn't have to wait long again. Following morning, I get a phone call from Corey again. Steven loved everything that he saw. I'm pretty sure they're going to go with you, man. There's a lot of excitement around here. It's not done yet, but I think you're in a good spot. And I'm like, okay. So then I was just on hold. And three days went by before I heard back. And man, those were a long three days. By day three, I had just given up. I'm just going, they don't like me. You know, I was so close. I'm, <laughs> I'm already like just starting in my little mental pouty sob story brain going, you know, I could have, I could have had it all type of thing. And um, and I get the phone call and it's Drew and he says, you know, you're our guy, uh, you know, we want you to do this project uh, you're going to be working directly with Steven. You're going to be working with our development team. You know, you're going to be the executive producer and kind of head this whole project up. Uh, that's what we need from you. Can you do it? That type of thing. And, uh, yeah, they took a couple weeks to negotiate the deal. Uh, ended up being an absolutely stellar contract. And I went to work right away for this rising project in which I was contractually bound for, for 12 months initially. Um, it turned into 18 months before it was all said and done, but the first contract was for a year. So one of the first things that we started talking about was um, a live event. Uh, Stephen wanted to do something big where people could log on all over the world and watch a live investigation and could be interactive. You know, there would be some kind of way we would come up with where the audience would kind of direct our moves and what we do and where we go. So one of the first things I knew that we had to do was to figure out, you know, from a technical standpoint, how could we, get the coverage we need 
and broadcast it live because those live um, Halloween like ghost hunting specials that you see they're always at really large locations you know multi multiple cameras six eight cameras um, from a technical standpoint it's a monster because a lot of times you're you know you have audio that is you know that is subterranean and it's really hard to pick up so we had never done this you know we didn't know how to do it and I'm sitting there at a table getting really uncomfortable with the fact that the number one thing that, that I'm, you know, that, that Spielberg wants to do is this. And I've never done it. Uh, when it comes to, you know, filming a normal paranormal investigation in my kind of uh, flavor or signature kind of style as a director, I can do that in my sleep. That's just the way I see things. I just make them the way I see them. And there's a feel to it, but I had never done, like I said, these big, massive live shoots that are subterranean and have multiple layers and these old, uh, you know, jails or hospitals that have no power to begin with. Um, it's just a big undertaking. So what I knew is that the series Most Haunted did live events all the time. And I had heard through the grapevine that they were coming to the Eastern State Penitentiary to do a live shoot. So my thought was, well, maybe I could call these guys and they would let me shadow them. Now, initially, I didn't have much hope that they would say yes, just because uh, these shows are very competitive. But beyond that, it was pretty obvious to everyone that Most Haunted faked a lot of stuff. Um, but, you know, you never know until you call, you know. And I found out that everybody on Most Haunted, you know, uh, all the cast members are also the producers, the directors, the DP. Like, they're all, they make the show. They're not just cast members. They physically make the show. So I remember I tracked down um, Yvette and Carl. They are married, and they're, like, the leads on the show. And I got, somehow I got the number to their production company and I called and it went straight to Carl <laughs> and he answered the phone and it was, it was Carl from most haunted, like the lead at most haunted. And I was like, Oh, Hey Carl, how you doing? And uh, we ended up having an awesome talk. We probably talked for a half hour and I told him uh, who I was with and what I wanted to do and was very honest and just said, I just, you know, we've never shot anything like this, and I would love to just check out how you guys do it. And uh, he said, sure, uh, when you come in, uh, you know, we'll take you on set. You can go wherever you want and, and you know, have a good time. And uh, while you're in, um, Yvette and I would, you know, love to meet up for dinner. So I'm like, awesome. Um, at that point, I had gotten Justin hired on uh, the show to handle all the technical stuff. So Justin went with me to Philadelphia. And uh, truth be told, I was a fan of Most Haunted at the time. And when I say fan, I was a fan because, like I said, I never... I, I didn't watch Most Haunted because I was looking for some scientific show. I was a fan of the characters. I was just a fan of the locations, uh, the comedy in it. Uh, clearly, they fake stuff all the time. But they never tried to come off as overtly scientists. I mean... One of, the, one of the reasons I like them is they had this gentleman named Kieran O'Keefe, who's a parapsychologist, who at the end of the investigation would pretty much call everybody out on everything that he thought was BS. And I'm like, well, geez, that's, that's really cool that they do that, that they have one guy at the end that says, well, this was bullshit and this was bullshit. And, and uh, so I was a fan of, of his. I was a fan of all of it. So... I mean, I'm on cloud nine, guys. I mean, I am living the dream right now. I mean, this is fun stuff. Uh, I'm flying everywhere first class. I mean, they're really taking care of us. You know, there's no garbage hotels. Everything is like a five heart or five star hotel. And that's because of the association, you know, uh, with that level of production and that, um, you know, when you get closer and closer to the, uh, you know, the true kings of this town there's a certain level you know that things are done and uh i was getting a full taste of all of it and it was fun it was really fun um 
So I fly into Philadelphia with Justin. We have a blast. Uh, we spend one afternoon just trying to figure out who has the best shake in Philadelphia. <laughs> That's what we did for work. We went around the whole city testing shakes. Um, <laughs> we went to see the Rocky Steps. Uh, you know, the Rocky uh, uh, statue, you know, because we, had, we, had, we just had time. We were just starting and uh, we weren't going to get together with Most Haunted until that night. We got in early in the morning. Um, you know, we had per diem, which was a healthy per diem. So we went out for steak dinners and stuff. I mean, <laughs> it was just crazy. Uh, but it was fun. And that's the life I was living that time. That was my job. So um, showed up to the set of Most Haunted and everybody um, was awesome. Uh, truly, everybody was really, really kind. And uh, that's when I met Kieran O'Keefe. And I got along with him really well. I learned he had went to college in Maryland. Um, yeah, and I just kind of shared, you know, my honest feelings, which is that I enjoyed the show. I found it entertaining. I owned all the DVDs. Uh, um, you know, it was just a lot of fun. And we really got to see how they did everything from a technical standpoint. Like we thought, it was a monster, a monster of a technical program. Um, it was just a huge setup. It was going to be challenging, especially the way we wanted to do it and the limitations at that time for online streaming. I really, <clears throat> I don't know, to be honest, when I think back about it now, back in 2005, I don't think technology was up to the level where we would have been able to be successful. Um, not the way... Uh, Stephen was envisioning. I mean, not that way. Um, but, you know, we, we were going to give it everything we had. We were definitely going to try. Um, but, yeah, that's where I made this friendship with Kieran O'Keefe. And the following night, um, that's when we have dinner with Carl and Yvette. And... I want to say this before I tell the story. They were incredibly kind and genuinely good people. But what occurred at dinner was one of the most confusing things that I've ever, <laughs> I've ever sat through because we went to dinner and they had so many questions about how did you get this job and what's going on? And, you know, we were limited by what we can say because of the NDA, um, but we could, you know, share, you know, you know, stories about our past and things. And, and we're having dinner and, you know, I'm asking about them and, uh, you know, their shows and how they got started. And, you know, it's a genuinely very pleasant evening and I'm, I'm loving it. And all of a sudden we're talking and under the table, like one of them hit it, you hear thunk. We're in the middle of a restaurant, a crowded restaurant. And Yvette's like, did you hear that? I'm like, huh? And she's like, did you hear that thumping sound? And I'm kind of sitting there like, yeah. But I don't know what to say right now because I believe you did. <laughs> you know, and I'm like sitting there and I'm like, yeah. And then Carl's like, yeah, it follows us wherever we go. And I'm like, huh. I'm kind of looking at Justin, and Justin is looking at me like I can see his bullshit meter is just screaming, you know. I'm like, oh, well, you know, maybe it'll, maybe it'll, you know, leave us alone for dinner and kind of make a joke about it. And a few seconds later, from Carl's side, thunk. And, you know, and both their hands, by the way, are under the table and they're leaning forward talking to us. So you can't see their hands, you can't see their feet. And they're like, oh, there it is again. There it is again. And I didn't know what they wanted. I did. I was just like, in my opinion, I'm 100% certain. And I mean 100% certain that they were making these sounds. They were hitting the table. They were hitting the table with something in their hands or something. And I didn't, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know, is this like their way of saying they fake stuff and they want to see if I go along with it 
Or do they genuinely believe that something paranormal was happening? I don't know. It was so confusing. And it kind of bummed me out because <laughs> up until that point, I was blown away by how just normal they were and how nice they were. And it, they were never not nice. That's what I'm, that's why I precursored this story because I genuinely liked them both. And I had a great time, but it got weird for about 15, 20 minutes because they kept doing it. Thunk, thunk, there it is again. It's back. Thunk. And, oh God, I just wanted to go. I bet if we took the tablecloth off and if we moved to the table five feet to the left of us, I bet we stop here in the Knox. You know, that's my honest opinion, Carl and Yvette. <laughs> Instead, you're making knocking sounds. So, if by chance uh, they weren't, then it was one of the greatest displays of paranormal activity that I've ever witnessed. Because these knocks were so loud, they were heard above, you know, the ambient sound of a crowded restaurant. Uh, so, Carl Nuvet, if you ever listen to this by chance, if those were real, I stand corrected and I apologize. But I think it was you too. <laughs> I do. Uh, so, yeah, it was funny. Afterwards, we wrap it up and we leave. And, and I was... Uh, you know, weirded out by that, but still kind of excited that we get the chance to talk and everything. And Justin, right away, he's just going, so what? what's up with that knocking shit? And I'm like, yeah, I don't know, man. And he was like, no, nah, dude. And he's like, that's crazy. Like, that was them. And I'm like, yeah, probably was. <laughs> you know? And he's like, oh, man, this whole thing's going to be weird, isn't it? And he means like the whole ride, you know? And I said, no, man, because we're not going to, we're not going to work with people that are weird, you know? And, uh, but the reason I'm telling you this story is this is how I became friends with Kieran O'Keefe. And, uh, because we just had a great conversation and Kieran seemed as normal and as cool as the other side of the pillow. I mean, like he was just. A great guy, laid back dude. Um, yeah, I mean, he was uh, super cool. And um, not even that after that, that we like stayed in touch like every week. Um, but, you know, there were a few messages exchanged here and there over the years. And uh, yeah, it was pretty crazy, pretty crazy that, uh, you know, we made that friendship because. Um, it was in 2012 is when I had the idea that I wanted to make a Blood Red Sky. And I, went, I knew I wanted to make it because we had just made American Ghost Hunter. And that was my family story and my story. And so much of my life uh, in regard to the paranormal field had been built around my story with the American Ghost Hunter. And if you've seen the documentary, American Ghost Hunter is not fun. It was not fun for me. It's important. It's an important documentary that I think everybody should see. I, I really, I, I mean that. I think everybody should see it. But it was not fun for me. It is an excessively dark, dark, dark movie. And reliving those memories are, are so dark that I was so ready to do something fun, you know, not to do something because it felt like therapy that I had to do. And I felt like I had to make American Ghost Hunter. I felt like I wanted to make a Blood Red Sky. And I knew the timing was right. We had people's attention because of American Ghost Hunter. You know, that had come out to rave reviews and people were super excited about it. And my thing was, let's just do this now. Let's do this now with a blood red sky. I wanted to do something fun. So when it came to ideas, if it wasn't for Paranormal State, I don't know that I would have come back to the idea of a film about psychokinetic ability. What happened on Paranormal State that really freaked me out is every single time on that show that they would send me into an investigation... I would capture something big to the point that I honestly thought 
for a time period that my ass was cursed. I was like, why is it that I am capturing stuff every single time? And big stuff. Like, I don't know what it was. But something was going on during that. And later on, I kind of figured out what I thought a lot of it had to do with. And I think it's that layer of disbelief. Because disbelief and skepticism will actually have an effect on whether or not you experience the paranormal. If you don't want to experience it, you won't. If you're certain it's not real, you won't experience it. But if you open yourself to it, you know, then you will. And I just have no veil of disbelief. Uh, the same as I know there is oxygen in the air. I know there is something going on in this world that we call ghosts. Some kind of interaction with energy that occurs in places throughout the world. I know that ghosts, as we call them, are real. I know this. And I think that had a lot to do with it. But I often wondered... Am I creating this? And I don't mean intentionally. I mean psychokinetically. Am I walking into a place that I believe to be incredibly haunted and my brain is manifesting some sort of physical placebo? You know? Am I causing things to move mentally? You know? I didn't know, but... That question weighed heavy on me. I wondered why it was. I mean, I had never been on a hot streak like I was during Paranormal State. I mean, it was just like clockwork, man. Find a place that's haunted, dark, and scary that nobody doesn't want to go. Send me in there. I will walk out with evidence. You know, it was, an, it was impressive even to me. To the point where I used to sit there and go, you know what? If I'm watching this... <laughs> I got to wonder, you know, is Chad up to something, you know, fucked up here? You know, thank God the evidence was always so good and it clearly established there was no way I could have faked any of this stuff. Because I can honestly say that I have never once in my life faked anything. I don't see the purpose in it. I think that defeats the reason for ghost hunting. And I think it takes a shit on anybody who's ever actually experienced anything real. And had any real problems with it, I think it would be uh, just disturbing to do that for so many reasons. But yet here I was, like I said, walking into all these places, capturing everything, uh, you know, every time. It was just every time. And I started even wondering if the crew was up to stuff. I was just like, Is, have they figured out, you know, some way to fake ship it? Every no, I would go back to the evidence. I'm like, yeah, no, there's no way anybody could have set that up because only I was there. I mean, that was the one beautiful thing about Paranormal State is 99% of the time during the dead time investigations, I was alone. And I love that, you know, uh, just because there's nobody to contaminate the room. And if I wasn't alone, I was usually with Buell. And I know Buell, you know, people have many opinions about Ryan uh, for many different reasons. The one thing I can tell you about Ryan is he does not fake evidence and he... Oh, my God. I mean, he would blow up on anybody. If he ever caught anybody doing that, they would be gone, gone, gone. So, that was heavy in my head. This film about psychokinetic ability. And I thought right away, I want to make it, because I want it to be fun, I want it to be kind of an homage to, you know, one of my favorite directors. And at the time, I was getting heavily into Kubrick. And, uh, you know, I had watched The Clockwork Orange a dozen times and just freaking loved it, man. Just loved everything about it. And I really wanted to make a film, a film, a documentary that had that type of vibe. Just a vibe. Not, you know, those are dramatically different movie. A Clockwork Orange is than, than obviously a Blood Red Sky, but that type of feeling and that vibe. And I knew right away that in order to do an experimental film on psychokinetic ability, I wanted to really focus on the fear factor. Because fear is what creates fight or flight. You know, and that's when your mind is, you know, 
processing overtime, man. When you're scared, you know, for your life, when you are physically, truthfully scared, passionately scared, that's when the brain starts just doing crazy stuff. And I knew that I wanted to get my team out of the States. I wanted to get them away from the U.S. and put them in a strange world where everything was new to them and they had that genuine feeling of being a fish out of water. So I started looking all over the globe as to, well, where would I go? Where would I go? You know? And I wanted to do somewhere that was spooky, but also cinematic, that had a rich uh, paranormal history. Um, and the first place that I was certain that we would wind up filming at was Venice, Italy. And I got a chance to go out there and scout it first. And I had never, at that time, I had never been overseas uh, as far as uh, the European side. I mean, I had been to Mexico, I had been to Canada, I had been to South America, I had been up, up into Alaska, I had been everywhere on this hemisphere, but I had never been over there. And uh, I remember landing in Italy, and then you, you go to this port, and then you take this long, like, geez, it must be an hour-long ride to uh, San Marcos Piazza, uh, the big square, where they drop everybody off. And it really was like being in a different world. If you've ever been to Venice, Italy, I mean, it is, it is a different world. Uh, and my God, do they love their gelato. There are these big glass windows with what looks like, uh, through the window, it looks like just uh, like an ocean wave made out of tar. <laughs> and you're like, what is that? And you go inside and it's this, Thick ass gelato. They just sell everywhere gelato, which is this basically it's ice cream. It's this different kind of form of ice cream. It's like Italian ice cream, but it's fucking everywhere. Um, but the place was as beautiful as anything I had ever seen. You could literally close your eyes and spin around in a circle and just start snapping off pictures. And I don't care what the photo was. You know, I'm not even shitting you. I mean, it was a postcard. Uh, it's totally what happens when a bunch of artists build a city uh, without anything practical in mind. <laughs> and what I mean without anything practical in mind is if you've ever seen the gondolas and the singing gondola drivers and the guys that, you know, you get on the, the gondola boats and they take you around singing in the morning and you go through all the channels and stuff. Uh, they have their main channels that they ride through and they take you on. But there's a lot of them that it, you get between these buildings. It's like, God damn, it stinks back here. Like, why does it stink so bad? And you come to find out that there's no, like, proper sanitation system in Italy and over there. It's just, you know, people's piss and shit is just, <laughs> it's just dumping from the bathroom right into the water. The same canals that they're, driving these gondolas on. And I was just like, oh, God, you know. It was terrible, uh, that aspect of it. Uh, so you definitely wanted to stay inland and stay, uh, you know, I say inland, it's an island, it's a floating city. But you, you know, definitely wanted to stay above uh, the watermark. Um, because when you do, you're just in this puzzle of beauty that is just incredible. Uh, there's these long, uh, really tall, narrow walking corridors where uh, the buildings are so close to each other, uh, you can barely fit through it. Like, you, know, you can walk from uh, one walkway to the other through the buildings that are next to each other, but it's like literally two feet. I mean, they just built this stuff so incredibly compact. Um, and I started talking to different people when I was there about the haunted locations that were there. And there were tons of them. Everybody had something that they thought was haunted. But I was let down because what I quickly realized is that for the film I wanted to make, Venice was just way, way too beautiful. Way too beautiful. I mean, it was just... I don't know how anything could look scary there just because it was so damn beautiful. Everything was just, you know, so uniquely Italian and uh, 
man, I mean, just the, the architecture, just all of it was just spectacular. I mean, it was nothing short of, you know, uh, the perfection at the hand of an artist on every street corner. And I'm like, you know, this isn't going to work. This is not going to work. And I was bummed out because I loved it there. I would have given anything to be there for like a week rather than two days. I was only there for a couple days. But I would have loved to be there for like seven days. Like that would have been amazing. Um, but I wasn't. And I'm thinking, fuck, well, what do I do now? I mean, let me go back to the drawing board here. Um, and at that time, you know, basically uh, to finance the film, it was just, you know, uh, four friends of mine and myself. And we all got together. We all liked the idea, the general idea. And we all just said, let's take a shot. You know, let's see if we could uh, turn this into something special. Um, but we had a min you know, a minimal budget. We had to be really, really smart about, uh, you know, the money. And, and uh, that's why I was so bummed out initially. I was just like, man, you know, I, I, if I wanted to go on just a vacation to Italy, I would have done that. I, that's not what I was there for. I was there to find the place I was going to be filming a Blood Red Sky. And it was just too damn beautiful. So I came back home uh, to the States and I sat down and I thought, okay, back to the drawing board. Where do I go? And a lot of places that I liked were in Australia, but I didn't know anybody in Australia at that time. And then a lot of other natural historical places that I liked uh, were in the UK. And initially I was like, but I don't know anybody there. And I'm like, wait a minute. Yes, I do. I know Kieran O'Keefe. So I reached out to Karen and uh, I said, hey, buddy, remember me? Um, you know, I have an idea for a, a documentary that I want to make uh, that I'd love to share with you. And I didn't know what he would think about it because it wasn't your typical, let's just go into a haunted place and try to film ghosts type of thing. It, it, was, it wasn't that. So I didn't know what he would think about it. Uh, thankfully, he loved the concept. He was like, okay, I see where you're going. This is fear-based. You have controls. Um, and initially, I didn't necessarily contact him to be in the film. I contacted him because Most Haunted goes to like every incredible location ever. If you ever want to see the most amazing places you could ever possibly imagine, if you could ever imagine, go watch some of those most haunted seasons. I mean, from, you know, Bodmin Jail to uh, Chillingham Castle to the uh, the High Wycombe Caves, which is the Hellfire Caves. Um, so, yeah, so basically I told him, you know, I'd love to take a look at some places uh, with you. Could you help me do that? I could flip you a few bones if you could take care of us when we're out there. Um, and handle the driving and like all that stuff and hook us up with hotels and and he he made it easy It was turnkey. It was really simple. He said sure come on out and we looked uh, at different places in, in the city um, But the second he said Chillingham Castle Something definitely kind of rang a bell with me and I'm like hmm Chillingham Castle because uh, I knew that was King Edward Longshanks Castle. I knew it was considered by you know, widely considered to be the most haunted structure on planet Earth. And after speaking to Kieran about it, he was like, yeah, it's the real deal, you know. Uh, but it was also uh, an eight-hour drive north of London. Uh, so to scout there would be, you know, you to fly clear the hell over there. Then once you land, drive eight hours. And uh, the second... You know, I landed, saw Karen, I just felt the vibe, it, it was working, we drove up, the second I saw Chillingham Castle, I was just like, oh man, this is it, I could feel it on the outside, the first time we went there, it was just myself, Karen, and uh, uh, Mary Beth, and Natalie, one of our friends that helped finance the film, and we get there, and 
you know, right when I walk in the courtyard, it's so spooky. I mean, oh my God, it was spooky. Nobody's there but us. Uh, Kieran takes us up to like the third floor of these old narrow stairs. I mean, this place is as authentic as it gets. And I'll get into a lot more detail about the castle in the next episode. But uh, we get up right away. We're starving uh, because there's no food. You're like three hours away from anything, anyone that can help you in the middle of nowhere. So we stopped and got groceries. And we sit down to make uh, or eat this pizza that we made. We just threw a pizza in. And we sit down, and right before we start eating pizza, you can hear children singing. And I look at Karen, and I'm like, what is that? He's like, you hear that? And I look at him, and I go, yeah, what is that? And he's like, what do you hear? Singing? I go, yeah, children singing. He goes, yeah, you can hear it in the castle. I'm like, there's no children here. And he's like, oh, no. No, no, no. I am like, wow. And it wasn't like faint. I mean, like you could really hear it. Now, what's interesting about Chillingham Castle is when it was constructed by Edward Longshanks, it was to not only torture the Scots, but specifically John Sage, the head torturer. He was about as disturbed as it gets. He was a disgusting human being. He loved torturing children. So they would bring the Scottish children there and they would make the parents watch the children be tortured. But having said that, there were rooms and rooms that were filled with children. And we sat there listening to them sing. We can hear them singing, which was incredible. After dinner, we go back to the uh, the main room that I'm going to be sleeping at and uh, Mary Beth's in there too and we drop our bags and I'm like wow look at this courtyard and you walk to the back and you can see kind of the edge of all these bushes that are chopped up perfectly and we just hear smash I'm like what the fuck and I turn around and there's a hallway that connects our room to the next room and the door that was just open just slammed hard as hell and again, you know, I come flying down the stairs. I'm like, Kieran, I'm like, you would not believe it just happened. And he goes, oh, that's the blue boy. I go, what's the blue boy? And he goes, did you open the middle door? And I go, oh, yeah. When I went in, I just opened it just to look to see where it went. And he goes, yeah, he doesn't like that door open. If you open it, at some point, he's going to shut it and he'll slam it just to let you know that, you know. I was just like, what are we talking about, man? I mean, we, we just walked into this place. And there's children singing, there's doors slamming. It was incredibly creepy. It was incredibly creepy. And what I knew for sure, what I knew for sure is that I had found the home for a blood red sky. On episode two, guys, we're going to get into more about the castle and more about the experiment and how I talked my team into doing this. Uh, because as you're going to learn, when they took off to go make this film, they didn't even know what they were going to be doing. They just knew it was going to be intense. And it had to be that way for what it was. But they literally did not know what they were walking into. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know what they were going to do. They didn't know what my plans were. So get ready. Next, uh, The next episode will be much longer as well, too. Like I said, I just wanted to give you the base and just kind of set up with this episode how this whole thing began and how it got started. Thank you guys. Thank you guys for being a subscriber to A Blood Red Sky. Notes from the most haunted structure in the world. This one's going to be a lot of fun. We'll see you next time for episode two.